Okay, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, this is the Sustainable Phosphorus webinar series. I'm your host, Matt Schultz with the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance. I'm joined by my co-host, Olga Borges. Uh, today's webinar is entitled Tertiary Considerations, Reducing Wastewater Phosphorus Loads. And um, we just wanna do a few slides of introduction and then we'll go ahead and get started. I want to tell you a bit about who we are. Uh, the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance is a members organization, and we're a central forum for uh, an advocate for the sustainable use, recovery, and recycling of phosphorus in the food system. And we're supported by a combination of uh, industry funds and also by uh, grants, uh, particularly from NSF. And what you see on the right here um, are a list of our members who have all contributed funds to help make this webinar and other activities of ours possible. So we'd like to acknowledge them and thank them. If you'd like to uh, become one of the cool kids and join this illustrious club of members, please reach out and contact us and uh, we'll put you through a hazing procedure and you can see if you can make it in. Uh, no, we're, we're actually very nice and we'd love to have you. So please uh, do reach out if your organization is interested. Um, we have these videos, along with many other videos, more than 50 hours of videos available on our YouTube website, um, youtube.com, Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance, all one word. And uh, you can find this video um, posted probably in the next week or two up there, as well as videos from all of our past Phosphorus Forum events and other content like our Phosphorus uh, Science Now video abstract series. So please go check us out and subscribe if you're interested in this content. We've also just wanted to let you know that we have developed uh, a sort of a public campaign called the 12 step program for a more phosphorus efficient you. And you can find this on our website at phosphorusalliance.org um, at the website address listed at the bottom here. Um, and this is just a set of steps that you can take as an individual at your house to help lessen your phosphorus footprint. Uh, so you can, um, there's a PDF here if you wanna circulate it among your stakeholders, if you have them. Um, you can go ahead and print that out and send it out as well. So just want to make you aware of that. Okay, let's get to today's talk. So um, what, what are we talking about today? Well, as many of you, of you know, the Clean Water Act uh, in the U.S. discriminates between point source and non-point source pollution, where point sources can be roughly thought of as those which come out of a pipe, whereas non-point source are generally the ones that come out in a more diffuse fashion, uh, the classic example being runoff from farm fields. Uh, as a result of point source regulations, uh, wastewater utilities have uh, implemented many technologies to reduce their nutrient discharges into waters and waterways. And that's really helped offset what's become increasing non-point source po pollution. Uh, we'll talk about what these treatments are and why they're not more widely implemented today. It's important to recognize that while much progress has been made on nutrient removal from wastewater, we still have a ways to go and wastewater discharges can still uh, contribute significantly to nutrient loads in overbought burdened uh, water bodies, such as the Mississippi River. Um, furthermore, we have opportunities to build partnerships, uh, particular, particularly between utilities and agriculture, and these can uh, manage nutrients more effectively and cost efficiently, and we'll, we'll hear a bit about that today as well. Um, Today's speakers are going to frame the historical context of wastewater nutrient removal, describe the technologies available to remove nutrients, discuss regulations that promote and sometimes undermine effective nutrient management, and uh, explore policies and practices that might enable a better state of affairs. Um, so with that, we're going to um, go ahead and start uh, with our first presentation. And I'd like to introduce, we've got three great speakers today, and I'll introduce them each at the beginning of their presentations. But the first one is Dr. Joanne Burkholder. Um, she's a William Neal Reynolds Distinguished Professor of Aquatic Ecology in the Department of Applied Ecology at North Carolina State University. Uh, her research emphasizes the effects of nutrient pollution on aquatic ecosystems spanning freshwaters to marine coasts. Uh, she's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and has authored or co-authored 185 peer-reviewed publications, or probably even more by now, Joanne. Uh, she has received numerous awards for excellence in research and for service in water quality protection, such as the Scientific Freedom and Responsibility Award from AAAS. Uh, in addition, she's been invited to testify before Congress several times on issues involving water quality and harmful algal, 
Elchi, and she has uh, served on several governor appointed policy boards involving aquatic resource protection. So, uh, Joanne, if you want to go ahead and take over um, the presentation, we can uh, uh, go ahead and, and hear from you. Thank you, Matt. I was asked to talk about the general background of nutrient pollution in U.S. surface waters, and the form of my presentation will move from a general background very briefly to impacts, and then finally some discussion of the status of this issue. Nutrient pollution, um, also called cultural eutrophication, affects surface waters similarly worldwide. That's the first major point I'd like to make. And this great quote by the late Val Smith says it very well. A remarkable unity is evident in the global response of algal production to phosphorus and nitrogen availability in lakes and reservoirs, wetlands, streams and rivers, estuaries, and coastal marine waters. So basically that covers it all. And the two nutrients most problematic are phosphorus and nitrogen. Primary producers, algae and plants, the photosynthetic first responders are most strongly influenced by those two nutrients because in most surface waters, they run out of those nutrients first. So that, it's basically that simple. Another basic point I'd like to make is that aquatic ecosystems are extremely sensitive to nutrient pollution. We humans are land-based creatures. We think in terms of land-based experiences. So when we apply fertilizers to land, we apply them in pounds or um, hundreds of pounds sometimes in crop lands. And one pound is equal to 454,000 milligrams. So we don't think a pound is really all that much, but this is how much phosphorus and nitrogen in inorganic forms that algae and plants use the most. This is how much is in relatively clear, pristine waters, 0 0.075 milligrams of inorganic N per liter and 0 0.005 or less milligrams of inorganic P per liter. So big, huge difference and, and worse yet in terms of the challenge that this issue presents. It only takes about 0.2 milligram of inorganic nitrogen per liter, that's nitrate and ammonia primarily, and 0.1 milligram of inorganic phosphorus per liter to cause the water to become more like this, this slimy, noxious, and, and sometimes toxic algal blooms. Nutrients influence aquatic food webs in two basic ways. Most folks are really comfortable thinking about the amount, the supply or the concentration or the load of nitrogen and phosphorus that are available to support algal growth. That sets the total amount of the, the plant and algal biomass or production that's created or fueled by the nutrient inputs. And then again, just as a brief comparison, 0.1 milligram of phosphorus per liter is enough to cause a noxious algal outbreak. But treated sewage from most water treatment plants, which typically um, it's changing for the better, but typically many of them still have just secondary treatment. And that treated effluent will have about one to seven milligrams of phosphorus per liter or more. So you see that the basic huge difference in, as part of the issue of wastewater treatment between what causes an algal bloom and how much is in treated sewage. And I should mention, and I'll try to stress during this talk that treated sewage with this amount of phosphorus, which is really huge for aquatic ecosystems, most of this phosphorus is highly bioavailable. It, the algae can readily take it up right away, um, making it a very potent source of nutrients. But the, the other way that nutrients influence aquatic food webs is by the proportion or the supply balance of these two major nutrients. They set the food quality. For instance, whether you'll have a lot of cyanobacteria at the base of the food web or whether you'll have beneficial diatoms and how they're doing, whether they're growing a lot, uh, really proliferating or not. Healthy freshwaters by, by atoms have an N to P ratio that's about 16 to one or higher, so-called red field ratio. Above that, phosphorus can be the primary limiting nutrient, the first major resource that the algae run out of if nutrients are limiting. And below it, below that ratio, so eight to one, seven to one, nitrogen can be the most limiting nutrient. 
early whole lake experiments really targeted and identified phosphorus so that the early emphasis has indeed in fresh waters been on phosphorus as the primary limiting nutrient in pristine fresh waters. The late great Dr. Dave Schindler and colleagues divided a pristine lake in Canada in half. And you can see that the, the visually see the results of his experiment here. And in this half, he added just carbon and nitrogen enrichment. In this half, he added carbon, nitrogen, and phosphate enrichment. And you can see no algal blooms here, but major algal problem here. From this classic experiment, um, we began to think about a phosphate control program in the Great Lakes system and eventually developed one. There was legislation that was passed to control phosphorus in sewage and legislation to remove phosphates from laundry detergents. So this was a major step in our understanding of phosphorus in general and its effects in freshwaters. But other research also showed that N can be important as well. And that's actually tacitly shown here in, in Dave Schindler's experiments because nitrogen and phosphorus were here in this part of the lake. Also, other experiments have shown that nitrogen and phosphorus together tend to be more stimulatory than either nutrient alone in many freshwater systems. The historic view, um, many surface waters were nutrient limited, but that's shifted to nutrient re replete. In the 1960s, 1970s, we thought that water column nitrogen and phos to phosphorus ratios indicated which nutrient was more important in limiting algal growth. That is because many lakes and rivers were still nutrient limited for the, the naturally occurring flora that were there, the naturally, naturally occurring algae and plants. And healthy fresh waters, as I mentioned, by Adams had an n to p ratio of 16 to one or a little higher, the red field ratio. Fresh waters were generally phosphorus limited with nitrogen secondary in, in importance, but that's changed. The present reality is that many, if not most fresh waters are no longer nitrogen or phosphorus limited considering what the natural assemblage historically needed, the naturally occurring plants and algae. The problem now is mostly excess supplies in skewed proportions. The naturally occurring beneficial algae have mostly been replaced by noxious or harmful cyanobacteria and other harmful species that thrive or bloom and cause outbreaks in nutrient over-enriched waters. EPA um, has, gen has recognized fairly recently, as many scientists as well, that there is a need to manage both nitrogen and phosphorus in helping lakes and rivers to recover from nutrient pollution both the concentrations and the proportion or ratio are important to control. And you can see that through this classic set of experiments done by Dolman et al. This is actually a summary graph from a study of more than 100 lakes. And these folks looked at maximal cyanobacterial abundance on this axis versus total nitrogen concentration or total phosphorus concentration. And you can easily see that the cyanobacteria in terms of overall biomass really like nitrogen and phosphorus both. In terms of impacts, shifting my focus now for just a very brief coverage of more than, I'd say hundreds, if not even more papers on establishing impacts from nutrient pollution. There's a very complex array and nutrient pollution affects every trophic level from the base of the food web to the apex. High nitrogen and or phosphorus amounts and skewed nitrogen to phosphorus ratios have been shown many times to lead to degraded food quality from shifts in major primary producers at the base of the food web. They cause this kind of pollution causes oxygen extremes, supersaturation, dissolved oxygen deficits, and high diol dissolved oxygen variation when during a 24 hour period, oxygen fluctuates by more than three and a half or four milligrams per liter, that can stress and kill beneficial aquatic life. There are adverse chemical changes from nutrient pollution like increased hydrogen sulfide gas toward the bottom of the lake or river and more dissolution into the upper water column of toxic metals. And even that, at that, some nutrient forms like ammonia and nitrate actually can be toxic themselves at higher concentrations. 
and regime shifts, abrupt changes of the degrading ecosystem to an altered stable state that's much less healthy and much less desirable than the previous state. And then many other food web impacts, especially loss of sensitive species and critical habitat and selection for noxious or invasive species. These are all mostly worse, we're finding out, with climate change. So nutrient pollution does not act alone. Um, in fact, other things that we're doing, like adding other types of pollutants and causing climate change, warming issues, exacerbate nutrient impacts. To reverse or partially reverse impacts, um, the last back, background information I'd like to touch on is that we can at least partially reverse the impacts if an exotic invasive species has been encouraged to take over by nutrient pollution, that's more difficult. But at least partly, there has been noticeable improvement that's often achieved with just two steps. Although they're simple steps, they're difficult to achieve often economically or socially. We need to decrease the external or watershed inputs of both nutrients back down to limiting supplies for algal growth at a healthy nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. And then in shallow, relatively shallow systems where the sediments with their the rich nutrient memory aren't very far from the surface of the water, we have to allow time decades for internal loading from the bottom sediments to subside. And this first ingredient of reversing nutrification impacts, we knew even back from the 1950s in the famous Lake Washington story. So, um, this is a classic illustration. This lake was degraded by sewage pollution. The sewage was rerouted, taken out of the lake, and the lake was able to recover substantially. But what about now? What are conditions like at present? As Matt mentioned at the beginning of this session, we seem to be in a downward slide. And in the past decade, um, we've seen these kinds of unprecedented blooms of, in this case, just one type of toxic cyanobacterium is shown in these, these photos, microcystis species. And you can see um, this incredible overgrowth in Lake Erie. You can see it from Lake Okeechobee in Florida, the Ohio River with recurring toxic cyanobacteria blooms up to 600 miles long. We're not winning this, this battle right now. In fact, nearly half of U.S. freshwaters have been degraded, as well as nearly two-thirds of U.S. estuaries. And the funding issues are part of the problem. We've gone from riches to rags, as I write here. Some of you folks may remember the late 1960s and the ecology movement. This is a great Life magazine article from that era. And when people recognized and began to really understand and appreciate that we had major problems with al algal blooms and other noxious problems from pollution. The Federal Water Pollution Control Act amendments um, were passed in 1972, and that became the Clean Water Act in 1977. And along with that public recognition and federal action came many federal dollars that were given to U.S. cities. In fact, many U.S. cities received the funding that made it possible for them to have a wastewater treatment plant with, with at least secondary treatment. That's why there's this big peak here. This is billions of dollars of funding over time during the period from about the past 50 years. And in the late mid to late 1970s, you see much higher funding. And then uh, with the Reagan administration, that funding basically stopped. And now it's basically down to a trickle for the most part. The gold here is adjusted for inflation, US um, 2017 dollars, and the blue here is nominal dollars, not adjusted. So this is a Congressional Research Service compilation. EPA is of 2018, um, estimated that about $104 billion had been provided for, to municipalities to take care of sewage treatment but about $270 billion were needed. And in present, um, Mr. Biden has taken some steps to try to help with infrastructure, but um, it hasn't been as much as he'd hoped for. There's only about 5% of the present deficit that's been addressed in recent federal infrastructure actions. 
And then there are environmental protection rollbacks um, that are going on as well to compound the problem. As the New York, this New York Times recent article states, EPA has made it easier for cities to keep dumping raw sewage into rivers by letting them delay or otherwise change federally imposed fixes to their sewage systems. According to interviews with various officials, many cities release untreated waste directly into wastewaters during heavy rains. That's still the case. And it's expected to worsen as storms intensify. So the American Society of Civil Engineers recently gave our country a D plus in taking care of its wastewater. Nearly 2,500 or 15% of US wastewater treatment plants have already reached or exceeded their design capacity, and that's projected to continue to, to increase. And some wastewater treatment plants are, are doing better. There's an example of wastewater treatment plants in Virginia that discharge into Chesapeake Bay or its tributaries, um, having both nitrogen and phosphorus limits on their sewage treatment plants. But progress is mostly slow as I, I, I think this EPA um, synopsis that I'm about to show you indicates. And you can see um, municipal sewage treatment is covered by the Clean Water Act as I state here and as Matt mentioned, but um, what about N and nitrogen and phosphorus limits in that sewage? I remind you that it's a very potent source of highly bioavailable nutrients. So recent, in the most recent compilation I could find, EPA described the top 10 states with the most major wastewater treatment plants. There are about 4,500 of them, as you can see, that discharge 1 million, gallon, uh, 1 million gallons of sewage per day or more. And here they are. Um, but this doesn't look good. As you can see, very few of them, even the major ones, except for California, have nitrogen limits at all. And phosphorus is better. I mentioned the early emphasis on phosphorus from the beginning of this, of, of our understanding of, of how nutrients influence our waters, surface waters. So some states are doing much better and the top 10 have at least much better um, and done much better in phosphorus limits than in nitrogen limits. And the P limits I have here in blue, both of them. And the best is Pennsylvania, but most of them are pretty low. So the best states for N2P, N plus P treatment um, in general, not the top 10, but in general are Maryland, Delaware, Florida, Montana, and Virginia, as I mentioned. The rest are mostly much less than 10% um, of their sewage treatment plants have both nitrogen and phosphorus limits. Total non-major sewage treatment plants much higher, um, as you can see here, but the same pretty dismal situation in terms of any sewage treatment plants that actually have nitrogen and phosphorus limits. And that's not the end of the story. These treated effluent limits aren't good enough, unfortunately. Um, secondary treatment is what most sewage treatment plants still have. And the treated effluents, when it's discharged from secondary treatment, still has 10 to 40 milligrams of total nitrogen per liter and five to 30 milligrams of total phosphorus per liter. But remember, algal blooms start to occur and cause problems at only 0.2 milligrams of inorganic nitrogen per liter, 0.1 milligram of inorganic phosphorus per liter. And there is a lot of inorganic nitrogen in these total figures that's bioavailable. So the inadequate nutrient limits um, are a huge problem and they're widespread from the perspective of aquatic ecosystems at least. I'm sure many of you have heard of Toledo's water crisis from this kind of ghastly looking uh, noxious to toxic cyanobacteria blooms. And that's been going on for about a decade. But as this newspaper headline states, Lake Erie's long been troubled and in the past decade has sustained more and more of these blooms that last for longer periods. And agriculture is a big part of the problem. Um, Maumee River comes in right here uh, along Toledo, but so is Toledo's sewage treatment plant. As it turns out, um, Toledo's sewage has phosphorus limits of one to one and a half milligrams per liter, nitrogen limits of more than 10, well over 10.2 milligrams per liter. This was just the ammonia concentrations. And most of this phosphorus was highly bioreactive phosphate. 
I remind you again, this, this magic set of numbers, it takes so little to cause an algal bloom in, in aquatic ecosystems relative to these kinds of concentrations. So I'm a strong advocate from the perspective of receiving surface waters anyway, of the need to squeeze the pipes a little better. And there's a lot to be said for improved treatment of municipal sewage. The nutrients are so potent, as I mentioned, it's considered the most damaging source of nutrient pollution affecting surface water because it has so much concentrated, highly bioavailable nitrogen and phosphorus. And it threatens drinking waters, potable source waters, and still threatens public health safety because um, this highly bioavailable nitrogen and phosphorus can stimulate toxic cyanobacteria blooms, for example. It has a long reach. In other words, um, relative to the amount of work and funding that would be needed, it's a major source of urban uh, con uh, nutrient contamination. And 87% of, of the US population is expected to live in urban areas by 2030. So better control of NNP and sewage would greatly improve many waters. The legislative groundwork is in place. Point sources are covered under the Clean Water Act. And perhaps um, we could expand that coverage at least to include some agriculture like livestock wastes. And there's a growing public awareness of infrastructure importance. So for all those reasons, um, I think aquatic ecosystems would be really well served by improved treatment of municip municipal sewage. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Joanne. That was a excellent, if uh, not a bit sobering uh, <laughs> presentation. Um, I think we definitely have our work cut out for us. Um, I just remind everyone that if you want to ask questions, you can uh, put them in the Q&A. We have one question that's come in so far, Joanne, if you could stick around for a minute to answer that. Um, so let's, I think you're, I think you're seeing my screen right now with the questions. Um, Olga, can you confirm that? We're looking at the right thing here. Yes, we are. Okay, great. Two great. Questions, so. <laughs> great. Okay, so the first question uh, for you here, Joanne, is are there no federal regulations on nitrogen or phosphorus discharge from wastewater treatment plants? The states um, typically are, are the entities that decide wastewater treatment, nitrogen or phosphorus um, limits, not the federal government. So the actual quantities, the actual water quality criteria are left up to the states. And many states have narrative standards. In other words, the state of Illinois, for example, says it's unlawful to cause or contribute to noxious or unsightly algal blooms or conditions in the water by adding too many nutrients. Boy, you can pretty much imagine how 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 hard it would be to try to enforce that. It, it's like quicksand. What's, what's unsightly? How much is, is too much? So for numeric limits on nutrients and sewage and elsewhere, in a, it, it's really left up to the states. Right now, there isn't very much still done yet at the federal level to try to come up with quantitative numeric nutrient criteria that would be much more clear to enforce, it's it's left to the states. Great, thank you for that answer. And um, Olga, is there a second question you say? You're putting it down? Yeah. Okay, so the second question here for you, Joanne, is are wastewater facilities incurring a cost due to phosphorus? Could the upgrade of infrastructure to remove phosphorus save money over time? We're gonna get to some of this in the future talks, but you can go ahead and give your, your answer here too. <laughs> Yes, those are better left to the other the other speakers, but um, it costs to remove phosphorus and um, costs, depending on how much removal there is, can cost quite a lot more. There is a process called biological nutrient removal, which um, folks speaking after me will very likely mention, which has quite a lot of upfront costs. Um, Early economic analyses indicated that it could pay for itself over a period of about 10 years. And so it's it's the upfront costs that tend to be especially difficult economically and socially. And then the second part of this question, could the upgrade of infrastructure to remove phosphorus save money over time? 
I'm not as well ad adapt to, equipped to answer that question, so I'm going to leave it to my successors. Okay, well, uh, luckily you have some uh, crack successors coming up here, some really <laughs> <laughs> big Thank guns. You. So uh, yeah, thanks so much for that uh, that presentation, Joanne, and um, we look forward to further discussion, hopefully later at the end of this session. Oh, uh, Olga, I just saw one other question um, came in. Maybe we can answer this one quickly, Joanne, before we move on to the for the uh, next one, next session. Um, and I'll just read it while Olga's pasting that in. Uh, it says, uh, how much do wastewater treatment plants contribute to algal blooms compared to agricultural input into Lake Erie? So the balance of point to non-point discharges to Lake Erie, essentially. There is a lot of argument about that issue. Um, there is there is a, a large group of people which who who think that cropland agriculture causes more problems for Lake Erie than wastewater treatment plants. But again, cropland agriculture, of course, adds nitrogen and phosphorus to soil. Plants take some of it up, some of it goes into rivers and then eventually into Lake Erie. But the city of Toledo sends a lot of bioavailable, highly bioavailable phosphorus and nitrogen right into Lake Erie. It's not attached initially um, to soil particles nearly to the extent that agricultural inputs are. It's much more potent, as I said, for that reason. So um, although if you look at the sheer quantity of nutrients, agriculture adds more, the type of, of nitrogen and phosphorus added by wastewater treatment plants and the potency of those inputs have to be considered as well. And I don't think they've been considered nearly as much as they should be. Great, thank you. The speciation is very important, yeah. Um, okay, great, excellent. Thank you so much again, uh, Joanne. And now we're gonna move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. J.B. Needling. And uh, uh, J.B. is the technical director for wastewater with HDR engineering. Uh, he's worked on many nutrient removal projects over the last 40 years, including biological and chemical phosphorus and nitrogen removal using conventional and advanced treatment technologies. He's the principal investigator for the Water Research Foundation's project to produce guidelines for optimizing nutrient removal uh, plant performance. So, JB, I can hand it over to you. I'll stop sharing my screen and you can go ahead and uh, share yours, please. And, and please uh, check that you're off mute as well. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, JB. All right. That means okay. I'm off mute. <laughs> yes, and we see your screen too. Thanks. Okay, well, um, I'm going to take on the challenge to talk about nutrient removal and recovery from wastewater treatment facilities, or as we now call them, water resources recovery facilities. And this is an overview of the talk that I'll go. We'll talk a little bit about what I call the stages of nutrient removal, to group them in buckets. Then we'll talk about phosphorus removal, some emerging technologies, recovery, uh, nitrogen removal, and then sustainability as we uh, come to a, an end. So um, let's start off with the stages of nutrient removal. Uh, if you go back to the 1970s when the Clean Water Act was passed uh, and I started going to school, we divided wastewater treatment as a whole in these five stages, preliminary treatment to get debris and rags and things like that. And we use screens and stuff like that to to take that out, big, big particles. Then primary treatment was focused on solids and it removed solids. Uh, and then uh, the solids uh, also contain BOD and we use primary clarification for that, just a, an example. And then secondary treatment, which is what the, uh, the law was all about, was to go after the soluble organics, the particulates, and we used a biological process in that case. So we went from screening to physical to biological, and then came tertiary processes. Tertiary processes were after secondary, and uh, that includes uh, pathogens, uh, turbidity, and use technologies like filters and disinfection to clean the water, produce reuse quality water that's used for agriculture, the golf courses and, and, and the like. And then advanced go after molecules. And so, oh, I repeated the slide, actually simplified it. There's the list, 
And then the question is within this large list, where does nutrients fit in? And the question, the answer is actually that nutrients fits into all these categories from primary all the way down to advanced treatment uh, to give us, uh, you can remove some nutrients. Now, very little at the primary level and everything at the advanced level. When we focus on nutrient removal itself, as opposed to treatment, um, in, at this uh, Water Research Environment Research Foundation project that we did uh, and completed in 2019, uh, we looked at three stages. We call them stages of uh, nutrient removal. And so this is conventional nutrient removal. This is what I would guide. Uh, the low hanging fruit. This is the first level of nutrient removal, <clears throat> taking the concentrations of nitrogen from the 30s down to at about 10 uh, and uh, phosphorus maybe to down to the one to two milligram per liter as uh, Joanna was talking about. And you can see some example projects, uh, technologies that we'll talk about in the middle. Tertiary is an add on that actually says, let's make do better. And now we ramp down the nutrient deduction by adding chemicals more consistently, add filtration, add uh, additional processes to enhance the removal. And then advance, we'll go after molecules and that is reverse osmosis where we exclude um, individual com com uh, molecular compounds. And those use advanced treatment processes as shown at the bottom. The focus for our talk today is basically on the first two phases. So let's talk about uh, phosphorus removal uh, to start with. When we talk about phosphorus removal, <clears throat> the question is or being how do we do it? We can do it with chemicals or we can do it biologically. We can do a combination of the two. But the key thing to remember about phosphorus is it must be converted to some particular form to remove. Now, nitrogen, when we convert it and remove it, we can go to nitrogen gas, but there's no gaseous equivalent for phosphorus. So conventional biological phosphorus removal processes is shown, uh, I'm trying to explain in this step. So here your objective is to grow phosphorus accumulating organisms to do a biological process. And we call them PAOs, phosphorus accumulating organisms. And the re if in biologically, you want to increase the bio biology with these PAOs so that they can do the phosphorus accumulation. There's basically two steps that these uh, organisms go through. Step one is what I call phosphorus release. And this is a function of the metabolism of the organism that it stores um, organics and, and then uh, use that as an energy source, which caused this release of phosphorus in uh, an anoxic zone. And the red arrow points to an unaerated zone of a wastewater treatment plant. The whole basin is the biological process. And the first part is unaerated that creates the right conditions for this release to take part and the uptake of organics that the bacteria will use for growth. Uh, step two, is then the phosphorus uptake. So then you go into the aerated zone, <clears throat> the one where you see the bubble zone, and that <clears throat> then allow the PAOs to take up organic. So you go from uptake to release, and then that gives you removal. There's many, many different arrangements. The top right-hand corner shows you a cluster of these PAOs. The purple uh, inclusions are the phosphates that's uh, recovered by the bio biology. And then you see at the, at the lower left, the upper middle right, uh, uh, middle top, different arrangements, lower bottom, some more. Um, sometimes the lower right, you will see these basins, these upfront basins uh, are covered because there's no oxygen and there's some odor coming off. And sometimes they are open as the other pictures show. Now you can also do chemical phosphorus in the room. When we do chemical phosphorus removal, there's also two steps. Step one is you add the chemical to form a precipitate. We need to remember, we need to bring the phosphorus into a solid form. And step two is to take the solids out, the particulates. And so the diagram at the bottom show you different places in the plant that you can add the chemicals at the primary treatment, the secondary or the tertiary. 
So in each case, you add the chemical, mix it in as shown on the pictures with different devices and, and then remove, let it settle or capture it in a filter. The facilities that you need, talking about the cost that you're gonna incur, um, you need facilities to receive the chemicals, to store the chemicals, and then to apply the chemicals or dose it with using some uh, specialized pumps. And so these are not complicated facilities. Uh, they are hazardous uh, to, uh, to have. Um, some emerging, emerging phosphorus removal uh, thoughts that's going on today as technology has expanded. Uh, one is this thing called uh, aerobic granular sludge. In the top left-hand corner, you see pictures growing. These grow bacteria into granules. They sep separate really fast. And each granule contains actually these um, organisms uh, and uh, can remove the phosphorus. Uh, they, that work in tandem with intensification, uh, using uh, selective uh, wasting. Uh, new treatment schemes, I showed you some uh, aerated and unaerated zones. Well, there's new schemes that emerge every day. We now have molecular techniques to, that show us which are the species that works. And we found out that even PAOs, there's different species. There's uh, Accumulibacter and Tetrasphera uh, that we can take advantage of their conditions and that helps. At the bottom, some ideas about chemicals. Uh, we know now that chemical reactions are not as straightforward and you actually get some sorption, instrumentation and control uh, uh, also helps to optimize the system. For phosphorus recovery, um, remember the main, the main principle is we have to remove phosphorus in a, a particulate form, except of course the only gaseous or airborne form of phosphorus is fil trickling filter flies or foam that flies off a treatment plant. Let's talk a little bit about the difference between removal and recovery. Phosphorus removal uh, from wastewater is to reduce, remove the phosphorus from moisture to reduce the phosphorus sent into the environment. In other words, we're impacting the discharge to the receiving water. And typically what we do there is we remove it, it goes into solids and we end up with the residuals from the plant. Phosphorus recovery is to take the phosphorus that was removed and then produce some marketable useful product or something that can be land applied to provide some fertilizer value to the, um, to the uh, agriculture. Looking at the mass balance um, will illustrate some of the fundamental principles. Let's say I show here a, a schematic of a plant with primary, secondary, tertiary processes, 100, um, if 100 uh, pounds is coming in and we remove 99% of that, we'll go from you know, 7 to maybe 0.1 milligram per liter. And then that will give us one pound going out from 100 to 1. That means that 99 must go through the solids. They have to balance out. Now, if we go and we do biological phosphorus removal, then what we do is we capture the phosphorus biologically in the secondary process and send it to solids processing. In solids processing, we actually release some phosphorus back and we may get up to 50 pounds coming back. So the 100 coming in now becomes about 150 going into the process. We still have one leaving plant and 99 coming back, but this recycle back um, impacts the process. We're still removing the same 99%, but we have no recovery in this. If we institute recovery, and, let, and let's say we put it in this uh, rich store of, 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 of phosphorus coming out of this capture, a biological process, and say we can remove 40% of the phosphorus, that means now we have 40% recovered, 59 removed, and one going out. So that's what phosphorus recovery will give you. Um, <clears throat> so the general approach, if you operate the biological phosphorus removal process, you grow PAOs, you release the phosphorus, and then you precipitate into something useful. 
And in this case, I'm showing uh, the most commonly uh, precipitant today is Struvite. And that uh, is from very fast and quick and produce these crystals. Um, so the important thing for this is to be a useful product, you can get um, an unrefined product, some technologies, <clears throat> a very refined project, and what I call a semi-refined product in the end. And what your final destiny of the recovered phosphorus is will depend on which one of these technologies you can use. Here are a smattering of uh, technologies that you encounter. And you can see there's, I, I just show six here. They're all different. They produce different end qualities and you need to select the process, uh, technology based on what you plan to do uh, with the recovered phosphorus. Um, the phosphorus recovery uh, remains a viable option. How does it stack up? It, it remains very viable uh, for wastewater. It, the economics of the operations is still challenging. And uh, if you just do a, a financial analysis, it's very difficult to make it pay for itself. But if you in, introduce other aspects like sustainability in your evaluation, that improves the viability. <clears throat> it also brings some other benefits to the wastewater treatment process. It eliminates nuisance precipitants and improves the waterability. Uh, and that re lo uh, recycle load that I showed you earlier goes away. <clears throat> the pictures on the right above shows you end products that's being sent to market. And then at the bottom, the pipe shows you some of these precipitants. This, these are the nuisance uh, precipitants that you can control by eliminating the phosphorus uh, from that recycle stream. There are still some uh, technical challenges and marketing and distribution of the product does require that you have something marketable, uh, a nice product that can be used by the public unless you go and use it as a land application uh, process. Um, switching uh, <clears throat> themes a little bit to talk about uh, nitrogen removal. We'll go skim through this since our focus here is phosphorus. Uh, nitrogen removal is a two, uh, can you, it's also a two-step process. First, uh, we take basically ammonia at the stick figure at the bottom, converted via nitrite in the middle to nitrate in a process called nitrification. Nitrification require aerobic conditions in your basin, which again requires this uh, aerated supply. Denitrification is the conversion of nitrate via nitrite back to nitrogen gas and it goes up in the air. And that occurs in this unaerated zone, very similar to the phosphorus removal. There's many different uh, options for nitrification and denitrification. And I show just a few uh, pictures here, top right and left hand corner. You can see the unaerated and aerated zones. Uh, in the lower left, this, uh, this is a fluidized bed used for denitrification. And uh, in this case, uh, it's a tertiary application. So chemicals are added to drive the denitrification. The chemicals come from methanol in the lower middle or some organics from the middle top. In the, uh, the right-hand side, you see some of the equipment pieces that's in play, uh, diffusers, mixers, and then this baffling, I wish you uh, wooden baffles here. These are not complicated baffles. They're not very expensive, but they help with the process. Um, <clears throat> nitrogen removal, like phosphorus, has uh, many new technologies that's now coming into, into play. Um, something that we call a shortcut nitrogen removal on the upper right uh, could, could be done in one reactor by modulating the aeration on and off and on and off uh, in the same reactor. Uh, the goal of this shortcut is basically, if you look at the lower left-hand corner uh, diagram, I showed earlier how we go from ammonia to nitrate and then all the way back to nitrogen gas. Shortcut basically tries to stop the process at nitrite in the middle. So you go from ammonia to nitrite and then straight up to nitrogen gas. And if you can achieve that, you can reduce the cost and uh, be more uh, efficient. There's other technologies, new bacteria uh, is making its comeback. Anamox is one of these that uh, will uh, shortcut the removal of nitrogen. Um, 
some new uh, technical developments, membrane aerated bioreactors uses a membrane to aerate and then grow biomass right around the membrane to give you reactor uh, efficiency. Uh, Microvi is an example of a biocatalyst where the bacteria is actually preformed and then uh, contained inside these biocatalysts that can be added just like a chemical into a bioreactor where these um, bacteria can then uh, remove the pollutants. It's been done pretty successful in water plants to take out nitrate, for example. A little uh, challenging still in wastewater, but we're getting it to work in that. And then instrumentation and controls is probably, is one of those areas that's rapidly advancing uh, and providing more efficiency. Um, just a few comments about striking a balance between nutrient removal and sustainability. As part of the Water Environment Research Foundation project that ended in 2019, uh, we looked at um, the cost and implications for achieving different levels of nutrient removal. And you show here level one is what is, is what we commonly call the secondary standards, 3030 of BOD and TSS. And then level two, three, four, and five is increasingly more stringent nitrogen and phosphorus limits. And level two, which is what I would call the, the first step, the garden variety, uh, gives you the eight and one or 10 and one level of nitrogen and phosphorus removal, total nitrogen and total phosphorus. And then you get uh, consistently uh, more and more uh, restrictive until the last one gives you uh, the most restrictive. The technology that's used for these, of course, varies. Um, this graph show you um, graphically what happens if you go from level one, two, three, four, five, at the bottom. And then on the left-hand side, we calculated uh, hypothetical pounds of algae that's grown per day in this, I think it was a 10 million gallon per day plant that we looked at. And then you can say, but rather than paying too much attention at the value, I wanna show the shape of the curve. And you get a very rapid decline, a big chunk of reduction, if you just go from BOD to level two or the first cut of nitrogen removal, the eight and one level, and then a, a pretty significant cut even down to level three, the six and point two. And then it gets more difficult and more difficult. Level five, to, to get to these levels consistently, uh, actually require uh, reverse osmosis or some membrane uh, process, exclusion process. Now, this is the benefits of adding the, uh, the treatment, uh, but there is some operating costs. And we calculated the contribution of that in terms of the CO2 equivalents per year that's being emitted by the process. And so you can see here going from level one, we see a significant increase to level two, then it rises all the way to level four, and then a big jump when we go to level five. Breaking this down just a little bit more uh, shows you where the cost lies. Uh, and the cost lies in the energy. The blue uh, is for pumping and mixing, uh, aeration, which is again energy. And then if you go in, 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 in reverse osmosis, the high pressure operation that's required. So in conclusion, uh, secondary treatment does, does not remove nutrients. Uh, conventional nutrient removal can be achieved by modifying an existing process, but always to maintain the capacity, usually add a new process that's going to pack capacity that's required for that. Um, so new uh, technologies and approaches from emerge constantly that will reduce the cost and improve, improve efficiency. And there are some secondary benefits, as, as uh, Joanne pointed out, and I'm sure Dave Clark will point out in his presentation. Um, that's it. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, JB. That was a great quick tour of the technologies available. And uh, I uh, appreciated the, 
you're talking about some of the trade-offs as well. And I, I know Dave will get to some of those too here. Um, I, I want to limit this to just one question right now and make sure we have enough time for Dave to get through his presentation. So um, we have a question here, which I had myself, it came from one of the participants in the, uh, uh, here, um, which is, uh, are there any estimates of nitrous oxide release from nitrification, denitrification processes? Yeah, the quick answer is yes, there are estimates uh, that the, um, the major amount of nitrous oxide that's being emitted is really when you go between the nitrification and, uh, and steps between, I showed you the two-step process, the middle step uh, is the nitrous uh, oxide, in, in a, what's it, NO2, N2O, NO2. N2O. Oh. Yeah, N2O. And then, um, and so that's where, um, that's where we see some of the uh, nitrous oxide coming out. Uh, fortunately, nitrite is a very low concentration in a typical process, and it's, um, it actually becomes more prevalent when you go to the shortcut methods. So uh, to, to cover that, often uh, plants are considering to cover that part of the basin and to trap the gas that's coming off that and then uh, treat it, yeah. Okay, great. Thanks again. And uh, if we have time at the end and there are any other questions, we can get to those then. But uh, in the meantime, thanks a lot, JB, for that presentation. Um, sort of tying this together now is going to be Dave Clark. So we've heard a bit about sort of the, the framing of the problem from, you know, an ecological, limitological perspective uh, from Joanne. And then we, we can kind of hear some of the solutions um, in JB's presentation, some of the trade-offs uh, implied, but um, Dave is now going to kind of put it all in a bow for us, I think, um, by talking about some of the policy uh, choices that need to be made and, and the trade-offs with those. So let me um, introduce Dave by reading a bio. Uh, he's the Senior Vice President and serves as HDR Engineering's Market Sector Director for Wastewater. Uh, he was the Regulatory Liaison for the Water Research Foundation Nutrient Challenge Research Program and the lead author on regulatory issues. He was the principal investigator for the uh, Water Research Foundation Holistic Approach to Improve Nutrient Management Research Project. And I want to say about both these Water Research Foundation projects, they're really excellent documents if you get a hold of them. Dave, I know that the uh, one you led, which um, on holistic uh, approaches to improve nutrient management, is available for free download with, I think, with a registra registration with the um, WRF website. Is that also true for the um, one JB uh, discussed, the guidelines for optimizing nutrient removal? I think it will be when uh, JB gets um, his publication released from WRF. So I think we're close there. Um, the 4974 project that you mentioned, Matt, is available for public access. There's a little bit of a gymnastic when you go into the Water Research Foundation webpage. You have to enter some information, but it'll allow you a free download. And that'll be similar for the Nutrient Optimization Project of JBs when the publication group releases his full report. I think we're close there. Great, thanks. Thanks so much. And you can go ahead and take uh, charge of the presentation now if you'd like and uh, share your screen. Okay, Matt, thanks much. Well, I, you know, I'm really stimulated by the two previous presentations because uh, there's a lot of information in, in what Joanne presented about how well we understand the nutrient processing uh, in receiving waters, how sensitive receiving waters are to nitrogen and phosphorus enrichment. JB has told us that we know so much about the tools for treatment on the wastewater side. I think it falls to me to try to explain why we are doing more of this. And I, I think that's an especially large uh, and complicated challenge to, uh, to address. I'm gonna try to use the Water Research Foundation project that Matt has mentioned as a framework to explore those uh, opportunities for improved nutrient management. And the converse of that would be like, why aren't we doing more? So in this research project, holistic um, approach to improve nutrient management, uh, we learned from a study of a group of watersheds across the country that were either, either success stories or stories of perhaps uh, frustration and limitations on the nutrient management 
that we formulated a framework in terms of three P's, practices, policies, and partnership as a way to explore where the limiting factors are. So practices, that's code for uh, the technologies and understanding uh, advanced wastewater treatment, best management practices for non-point sources, and all the water quality science that Joanne has summarized. Policies is all about the regulatory framework in the Clean Water Act, um, NPDES uh, discharge permitting for utilities. Partnerships is about leadership and collaboration and how that's uh, formulated or a limiting factor. So that's the framework I'll try to use to explain why in some circumstances, when we have an over-reliance on the treatment technology alone, there's a limit to how far we get in terms of nutrient management in a watershed and we don't get further. When there's an overemphasis on the regulatory dimension, uh, sometimes that can result in some pushback that limits how far progress is made in nutrient management in a watershed. And in other cases, um, you know, it results in disproportionate regulation that's frustrating. And so I'm gonna use an example here to highlight um, some of that uh, lack of balance in the three Ps of practices, policies, and partnerships as a way to you know, explore where the limitations are and why we can't get further. Uh, the example I have here is an important watershed in, uh, in Montana uh, on Ashley Creek and tributary to Flathead Lake where the city of Kalispell has had one of the most interesting advanced nutrient removal treatment facilities operating in a cold weather environment for about 30 years and really um, doing a terrific job of, of reducing nitrogen and phosphorus loadings to surface water, recognized with awards, and to Johan's thresholds for where we have um, nutrient enrichment stimulation. Effluent quality is really terrific from Kalispell and the phosphorus end, we're down to about 100 micrograms per liter of phosphorus. And that's getting close to those levels to throttle primary productivity in the receiving waters that Joanne was referring to. We're higher than that on the nitrogen into things at seven milligrams per liter. And the real contradiction that I want to point out here is that kalispell has been reducing phosphorus loadings since the 1980s, um, but we're still pending a new permit renewal that may force even lower effluent limits than they have now with both nitrogen and phosphorus control. And, and the real uh, discontinuity here is on the other side of the stream from the city's discharge, we have cattle that are grazing right in Ashley Creek. And so the question here is about where the next level of investment should be. Should we try to squeeze the pipes as Johan has, uh, has suggested, or do we work on those non-point source loadings? So I think in terms of the, the three piece framework in practices, the impressive thing that I have to report is with what Johan has presented and what JB has presented, we know an awful lot about the water quality science. Uh, the Water Research Foundation publications that Matt and JB have referred to, you know, tell us an awful lot about point source wastewater treatment. We've learned a lot over the past 40 years about how to do that in a very specific way. There's a growing body of information that's helpful on, on agricultural best management practices, urban stormwater best management practices. And so I think I would say that for both point and non-point sources, that we have a strength in the practices category. Uh, we know very specifically how these wastewater facilities will perform. It's a very deterministic approach to the design and sizing of facilities. And on the non-point source side, we recognize that the best management practices and their performance for nutrient uh, reduction, they're more variable, but we definitely have tools and we're learning more and getting into greater level of detail about nitrogen and phosphorus speciation like we know about on the wastewater side. We're learning more about that on the non-point source side. Now, complicating things is climate change because it brings new challenges. So for utilities that discharge to surface water, you know, we may have a greater need to control nutrients than ever before. Climate change does other things that kind of compromise some of our strengths in the practices category because um, extreme weather conditions just, and they drive peak flows to wastewater utilities, make it more difficult for us to accomplish the levels of nutrient removal that we need. And as JB has pointed out in this balancing act, we recognize as we climb that staircase to ever increasing levels of nitrogen and phosphorus removal in the wastewater facilities, 
We're using more energy, we're using more chemical, we're creating more residual solids, and then all of that contributes to increases in greenhouse gas emissions. So we're having an impact on the environment. Now, the other part of this that's so fascinating where we need to learn and understand more to really do the balancing we need in watersheds is that those nutrient loadings, if they're not removed in treatment facilities, they're gonna result in the growth of those giant algae blooms that Johannes has shown and those decay and those result in greenhouse gas emissions. So that's kind of at the frontier of what we need to research to understand more about how to come to a balancing point. But we do recognize that climate change is an overarching issue over our entire framework of nutrient management in watersheds. So in terms of practices, you know, we know that we have warmer temperatures may result, warmer surface water temperatures may result in more harmful algae blooms, greater incidence of hypoxia, and in those cases, more greenhouse gas emissions that continue to fuel the climate change. In terms of policy, balancing these considerations, that's at the frontier of where we have the models to really understand how to do that balancing on both the treatment side and on the watershed side. And then we need a lot of cross-discipline coordination to have effective partnerships. I think we also recognize that environmental and social justice is another overarching feature in our framework because those in disadvantaged communities experience the worst in terms of water quality, we know that if we invest in nutrient reduction, it costs more. And so there's an affordability issue in terms of environmental justice because the communities that are disadvantaged suffer more proportionally from our need for more investment because we have to raise sewer rates and utility bills are proportionally more uh, of a stressor on the disadvantaged communities. Now, compounding these challenges is recognition that a lot of our infrastructure is getting old. And I think Joanne in her presentation in highlighting the American Society of Civil Engineers grade of a D plus for wastewater infrastructures, it, you know, it does exhibit something that JB and I experience working with utilities as that we have a competing demand to reinvest and renew the assets to maintain even the basic functions, let alone get to the point where we can invest in advanced levels of nutrient reduction. So there's competition for resources here. It's not just nutrients. It's the investment required for renewal and replacement of asset management, but also to respond in terms of uh, resiliency to fortify our facilities so that they don't, they don't flood. Uh, often we're located in the shoreline, we're vulnerable to sea level change, climate change driving peak wet weather flows, it creates a, a bigger challenge for us to control spills, manage stormwater, and then we have other regulatory compliance requirements that are very important. Toxics control, ammonia for aquatic organisms, also a nutrient issue, human health water quality um, uh, constituents, PCBs, arsenic, mercury that we also need to control in wastewater facilities, thermal loads, so temperature loading to uh, important receiving water bodies is key for protecting aquatic life and biosolids management, which is also a nutrient management issue, or at least it has been for the past 30 years, and maybe is becoming more of a perfluorinated compound issue now. So wastewater utilities need to address these multiple priorities. And at the baseline, they need to maintain the base functions and compliance with the existing requirements and then figure out how to manage all the new requirements that include nutrients and how best to approach all of those demands. So in the policies dimension here, how do we find ways that we can strengthen the policies and maybe provide a level of flexibility and compliance that fosters progress and nutrient reduction and at the same time allows us the, the features of adaptive management that provide for learning more about what levels on a site-specific basis are important for nutrient management and how to implement that in a way there's not resistance, but yet there is a, a catalyst for moving forward. And I wanna mention both adaptive management and integrated planning as real keys. I think Joanne has pointed out the lack of the federal funding programs that evaporated years ago is has resulted in a, in a reduction in funding for investment. But the good news is we have a new tool for balancing uh, these investments on local priorities in the 2019 Water Infrastructure Act 
that codified in the federal regulations an integrated planning framework. And EPA has a very clean framework for integrated planning, but what it provides for is an adaptive management approach to considering those local priorities and balancing those competing demands that I highlighted, and then putting those together in a way that informs discharge permitting, provides for compliance schedules over multiple NPDES permits, and, and is specifically to inform water quality-based effluent limits that are associated with nutrients and consider affordability. So I wanna have a, a provide an example here of, of a set of challenges, but more of a success story in terms of policy improvements and also fostering partnerships from San Francisco Bay. So here's a very important water body, a large population, six or seven million people. There are 37 water resources recovery facilities that discharge to the Bay. And historically, the Bay has been characterized as at a tipping point for nutrient loadings and nutrient enrichment. But there's no specific endpoint for establishing effluent limits for nitrogen or phosphorus that have yet been established for the Bay. But we've had a very effective collaboration that includes the Bay Area Clean Water Agencies. That's the partnership of the 37 uh, water resources recovery facilities, along with the regulatory agency, the Water Boards, Regional Water Board. And then the science group, the San Francisco Estuary Institute and the Baykeeper, who have worked together through a nutrient watershed permit that's provided some really interesting, I think, advantages to better prepare um, those that manage nutrients in this watershed for all of the challenges that we've mentioned that are associated with nutrient loadings, climate change, aging infrastructure. So a couple of highlights from the watershed permit on San Francisco Bay. Um, and this evolved from somewhat of a chaotic circumstance back in 2010 to 2012, where individual NPDES discharge permits were coming out with different requirements for uh, nitrogen loading analysis and nitrogen management. The first watershed permit unified that approach as a result of that collaboration between the Bakwe Utilities and the Regional Board. 2014 permit, it didn't have any specific effluent limits because we haven't had those defined from a science standpoint. It did have requirements for management approaches and funding from the wastewater utilities to support the San Francisco Estuary Institute science work. It combined and unified the permit renewals for all 37 utilities, provided for group reporting, and we undertook a really large study so that we could get all the utilities, uh, the water board, SFEI, all on the same page with regard to what it would take to reduce nutrients either by optimization, side stream treatment that JB highlighted, and then a couple of levels of nitrogen and phosphorus reduction so that we could see for each of the 37 utilities what it would take on a site-specific basis and then in aggregate, to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus at these different levels and then how much it would cost. So this allows everyone to participate as a stakeholder in a partnership from a more informed position than we've ever had before. The permit was up for renewal in 2019. And so there's some interesting enhancements. Again, there are no specific load caps or effluent limitations, but there's increased funding for the science work at the San Francisco Estuary Institute there are incentives that are built into the permit. Where we don't have effluent limits, we do have load accounting for nitrogen in the fact sheet for the permit. And there's recognition of a reward for early actions to reduce nitrogen loadings to the bay uh, by moving the priority for renewal of the rest of a utilities discharge permit to the bottom of the priority list. So the incentive there is to take steps early and then have uh, less onerous requirements for permit renewal. And there's an enhancement in the aggregate group reporting now that the regional uh, reporting annually now includes what we call nature-based solutions or nutrient reduction by other means. So one of the enhancements now that we see through this adaptive approach over multiple permits is that we're bringing multiple benefits into focus. 
reuse to augment water supply during drought, or at least the drought we used to have in uh, Northern California. Nature-based solutions then that uh, the example here, the horizontal levee is a way to address sea level rise, provide habitat and also nutrient reduction. So that all becomes a part of the nutrient management approach for San Francisco Bay. So in terms of partnerships then, what can we do to strengthen approaches? And when we look at some of the watersheds where we think we've made progress, um, some of the highlights are that we can better understand what fosters a successful partnership and also better understand what those barriers are to formulating effective partnerships. And so understanding the roles and those key success factors, I think is something that is important to be understood more broadly in order to make progress on nutrient watershed management. And I'll just highlight a couple of examples here where I think leadership and collaboration have been a real key for that partnership around San Francisco Bay. It's a really unique collaboration. And Dave Williams, the retired executive uh, director who recently passed, uh, was really key as a leader of the utilities in his engagement with the permit writer, Tom Mumley at the California Water Board. And Dave would describe the interaction between the utilities and the water board as shuttle diplomacy. And Tom, in his conference presentations, always refers to the collaboration as, as hard-ass collaboration because it's not always easy. And we still have water quality challenges around San Francisco Bay. I think the other example I'll point to from our Water Research Foundation study is on the Middle Cedar Partnership, where again, we have this unique um, combination of leadership and collaboration as a catalyst for improving the partnership. Steve Hirschner, the Director of Utilities for the City of Cedar Rapids, Roger Wolf, the Executive Director of the Iowa Soybean Association, uh, an ag producer organization, you know, work together in a local process to manage nutrients in a more informed way. And we're making progress, I think, on both the non-point source control and the point source control in the cedar. Um, last thing I'll mention uh, regarding that improvement or improved approaches to fostering partnerships is that we were inspired in the Water Research Foundation study by the integrative collaborative governance model, where we learn from the social sciences, and in particular here I'll cite Jennifer Biddle of the University of North Carolina Wilmington, as helping us understand those that have actually studied watershed groups to better understand how to combine principled engagement, a shared motivation, a capacity for action in a way that we can actually make progress, that we can understand from the outset in watershed management groups how to form a mission consensus, how to build trust with time. And, and I know from my own experiences the last couple of years in a couple of watershed groups, when we lack the kind of skilled facilitation that's required, a shared understanding of mission consensus, that we can have some dysfunctional things that are really frustrating and limit progress in watershed management. So we liked featuring this work in our Water Research Foundation report because I think it, it helped us understand how to do better in forming partnerships and fostering collaborations. So with that, Matt, I'll turn back to you and see if we've got questions. Great, Dave, thanks so much. Uh, that was a very nice presentation. Um, let me share the screen here so you can see the questions that have come up. Uh, one is the question that was posed to Joanne earlier, and maybe um, JB or you could take a crack at it, but maybe first we could get to the second question listed here, which is, <clears throat> um, are there any planned regulations or incentives to encourage nutrient recovery outside of the direct spreading of biosolids to agricultural lands? And <clears throat> this might be a good question for JB as well. Well, maybe I can start off there, Matt, and, and I have been inspired by some work in Colorado uh, called Colorado Policy 17, which attempts to incentivize early reductions in nutrients. And the idea there in kind of a unique um, set of policies, the nutrient regulations in Colorado are implemented over time. So water quality based effluent limits that would be based on the in-stream nitrogen and phosphorus standards won't take effect until 2027 in Colorado. In the meantime, 
if a utility makes an early reduction in nitrogen and phosphorus reduction now for the length of time and the degree to which they reduce nitrogen and phosphorus, they can earn extra time beyond 2027 when the water quality based effluent limits would take effect. That policy 17 on incentives, you know, that has inspired us to include that idea of incentives in other locations. We did brief the, uh, the Bay Area Clean Water Agency's uh, water board about that about 10 years ago. They did wrap that into the second watershed permit in San Francisco Bay. That's where the incentive idea came from. So I think that's a really unique way to look at the policy considerations that may unlock progress in, in nutrient management. I don't know, JB, do you want to do you want to add more to that? No, I think you got it covered uh, on, on the regulatory side. I know there are regulations uh, that discourage the application of phosphorus uh, through the phosphorus indexing that's being done on certain lands to make sure that it's uh, balanced on the agricultural lands. But uh, beyond that, there's no really incentives from a regular perspective that I uh, am aware of. Great, thanks for that answer. Um, uh, one other quick question here, and then if we have an, a minute or two, I have a question of my own to sort of help wrap things up, which, um, so the question again, uh, maybe JB, uh, this would be good for you again, um, could the upgrade of infrastructure to remove phosphorus save money over time? <clears throat> the um, Yeah, it, it depends on the level of uh, phosphorus removal that's required. If you're re removing, just reducing some of the phosphorus, then there are some a savings to be had in terms of the maintenance of the facility if struvite becomes an issue. Struvite is the way we recover phosphorus, but struvite is also the precipitant that would uh, give uh, large headaches to, uh, to pl plant operators because it coats the inside of pipes, it precipitates on outlets and cl clock pi pipes and, and valves and uh, other uh, appurtenances. Um, but so it's kind of a backdoor uh, cost savings, uh, hard cost savings, uh, because the implementation of uh, phosphorus recovery uh, will add some uh, costs because of the chemicals you have to add. Very often we have to add magnesium hydroxide or some magnesium to fully take advantage of the phosphorus you can remove. So it's a balance that uh, needs to be evaluated to determine the, the balancing points. So JB, I think we could say that, you know, on your slide where you showed the refined uh, struvite product over on the right hand side of your slide, those were, uh, I think, uh, austera struvite crystals, and those do provide a revenue stream um, for wastewater utilities, you know, clean water services, I believe, has annual revenue from austera. Uh, for the struvite product. It's not enough to offset the capital and operating costs of the struvite facility, but it, but it is a revenue source. Uh, correct, yeah. So you can generate a revenue source that way. Uh, and as you say, yeah, it, it, doesn't, it may not cover the operating and investment. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I was hoping to have a little group discussion amongst us here, but I, I see looking at the time, we only have about a minute and a half left here. So uh, maybe to be continued at another uh, forum. Um, I do want to take the time both to thank the audience for coming, but also um, especially to thank you presenters for uh, taking part of this. We've had some really great discussions via email and some of them live as well. And uh, I hope that this kind of communication helps people arrive at uh, better solutions for some of these problems that seem almost intractable. But um, let's uh, keep the discussions going. And uh, hopefully, Dave, some of these partnerships yield some solutions that um, uh, are sort of optimal across all parties involved. Yes, we agree. And it's been really uh, fun to have the exchange with you, Matt, and with Joanne and JB. John mentioned yesterday how unfortunate it is we haven't been able to get together in person. But hopefully we'll get to do that in the future and, and talk more about how to tackle these challenges. Well, the next Phosphorus Forum is happening in February, end of February, uh, in the Phoenix area. So that might be a chance that we can all do that. And hopefully all the audience can come to that as well. Uh, again, thank you very much for all your work uh, putting this together. And uh, thanks for joining us uh, for the Sustainable Phosphorus webinar series. We'll have another one of these in a, in a few months. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Take, take care. It. Goodbye. Yeah.